Hey, 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 ladies and gentlemen, and we are live now. Ladies and gentlemen, every Thursday, as usual, you are now coming on to the Ernie Chan Show live. Yes, every Thursday, the Ernie Chan Show live, and I'm your host, Ernie Chan, of course. Every single Thursday, we bring you the movers and the shakers of the industries, people that we can actually learn a thing or two, or even more than a thing or two, in their respective industries and the business. They are definitely the movers and shakers and people that we can definitely, definitely, definitely pick up a pointer or two so that we'll be able to hear and listen to their stories as to what they have been doing, how they managed to build their businesses and all the challenges for them to overcome to get to where they are today. And I'm sure a lot of you here look forward to watch the Ernie Chan Show because every single Thursday, you get to learn a lot of things from my show, not just from myself, of course, being an entrepreneur, I know how difficult and challenging it is for you out there. If you're an employee, I'm sure you are also thinking about, because in times of critical challenges, we are always looking for opportunities. Some of you here potentially are looking to perhaps become an entrepreneur and start your own business as well. So if you're an entrepreneur, great. You learn from other entrepreneurs. If you're an employee thinking about starting your own business to become an entrepreneur, this is the perfect show for you to learn from the movers and the shakers of their industry. We have personalities, we have celebrities, we have big tycoons, we have politicians, we have the movers and shakers on the Ernie Chan Show. So if you just join us over here, do share, do tag, do bring on all your friends and everyone who is an entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur who's thinking about starting their own business because tonight I've got another big kahuna, another big gun over here from the food and beverage the F&B industry because we know the F&B industry has been badly affected, badly impacted by the coronavirus situation. The pandemic has not stopped, has not slowed down for most countries. In fact, in America, it has increased. So it's definitely affecting a lot of F&B businesses all over the world and Malaysia, even though we've kind of gotten the coronavirus in control. But guess what? As I speak to a lot of my F&B business owners out there and my friends most of them are telling me the challenges and the difficulty for them to be able to live the new way of new norm for the F&B business so I think tonight I've got someone over here potentially will be able to share a thing or two of us because why I'm sure he have gone through a lot of challenges and difficulty over his many many years for him to be able to build his F&B business and I'm sure his business has also been affected by the coronavirus pandemic so we will definitely want to listen, learn a thing or two from this mover and shaker, the F&B business and whatever else business that's involved in. Ladies and gentlemen, as usual at 9.30 on the Ernie Chan Show, who do we bring on right now? I'd like to bring on the founder and the CEO of this F&B restaurant, which is pretty cool, pretty awesome, where you can dine like a dawn. Uncle Don's founder and CEO, Yanom. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Yanom. Hi, Yanom. Ernie. Hi, Ernie. Hi, hi, hi. Now, for those of you who do not know this uh, big muscular man over here, I've known him for more than 35 <laughs> years. Yes, I yes. was a young pup and he was actually my senior for about three years. He's a friend of my brother's and we were all playing ping pong. We were studying in two separate schools, one in Bukit Binta, myself, and he's from Lhasa. Of course, we have always been competing on ping pong, and he's a multi-talented, not just in business that he's setting up, but also a multi-talented pianist, musician. So, ladies and gentlemen, today I bring to you someone who's very, very profound in the F&B industry because I'm sure he has filled a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, founder and CEO, the leader, the man behind the Uncle Don franchise. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, yes. How are you? Hi, everyone. Very good, very good. Ah, fantastic. I hope everything is good there, and Ernie. Very good, very good. All on my side. You're at home, right? Yeah, speaking to you from, my, from the comfort of my room. Fantastic. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for having me on your show. That's the whole idea. We're going to bring in the movers and shakers, and of course, uh, Uncle Don's under your leadership is definitely moving and shaking up the whole entire F&B industry because it's now becoming like the, the restaurants of the 99, you know? <laughs> the 99 is like every single corner, every single small little community, there must be an Uncle Don's. And I personally, you know, didn't even know you opened Uncle Don's when I had my first time experience in SS2 Uncle Don's. 
And then I realized it was yours, you know? So uh -huh. that, that was pretty interesting. Now, before we start, it's good for people to get to know you a little bit better. I'm going to ask you three questions over here. You All have right. two choices and you have to answer and pick one of the two. You cannot say, no, that's not my choice. Or you cannot say, no, I think I have another choice. You have to pick either one of the two. Cool? <laughs> so I'm going to have to answer two questions, yeah? Three questions, two choices right. per question. All you right. ready? All right. All right, first question. Nasi lemak or chicken rice? Chicken rice. Chicken rice. We have the still the Chinese China boy, you know, this <laughs> chicken rice boy over here. <laughs> Very good. Second question. Business or holiday? Business. Business. Okay. Still enjoy business. That's good. Right. That's why we got the lens of business uh, strategies and business mastery from you itself and how you actually managed to build the franchise so quickly, so fast and became a household name, you know? And third and final question. Family or friends? Family. Family. Without a single yeah. thought about it. Yep. And I feel so bad right now, you know, the family is so important. <laughs> of, course, of course, the wife is an ex-colleague and a good friend of mine also. So, hello. And of course, uh, I'm sure all the friends here later on, you can give Ian a hard time, you know, because he selected, he chose his family over you guys. So, give him a hard time, ask him to uh, buy you some drinks at Uncle Don's. Now, wanted to bring to everyone's attention, you know, if you just join us over here, you're watching the Ernie Chan Show Live. I'm with the founder, CEO, the man behind the brainchild, you know, of this whole entire franchise that becomes such a phenomenon within such a short period of time. Uncle Don's itself, you know. I know Uncle Don's came from your chef, your partner, who is uh, Don Daniel, is that correct? That's right, that's right. So how did this whole entire Uncle Don concept came about? This entire concept came about, well, actually, I got to know uh, Don Daniel by chance. I was prowling the streets in, um, in Changkat one evening with a couple of friends of mine on a social uh, visit uh, and to rush down to, to Changkat. And so this is where we, we had a couple of drinks down there and this is where I met this, this elderly man that was singing on a mic. And uh, he gave me a complimentary plate of food or something like that. So that's how our friendship started from there. But of course, it didn't start there and then itself. It was uh, maybe after about a year or so after that, that we really met up again. And that's how things uh, took off. Okay. I See, yeah. I remember you being a, league, a law student, legal student, you know, you were yep. studying law with my brother. And then somehow or another, I know you also taught law for some time. And yep. I remembered that you were in the F&B business for some time with various brands. And somehow they did not boom, like what happened to Uncle Don's. So what do you think was the difference between what you did to what happened with Uncle Don's? Well, initially, uh, my foray into the F&B industry was based on what I like to do. So I used to enjoy clubbing very much and all this kind of stuff. So if the foundation of starting the business is basically because you like that kind of lifestyle, then of course the advice would be you have to think twice first because uh, <laughs> it's very, very challenging. There are a lot of twists and turns which you probably cannot foresee that is coming your way. So you kind of went into it. I remember Dukes and Duchess, is that correct? Yeah, and yeah. Dukes and Duchess I is very much a later brand that we, we, we still have it today. Sure. It was, yeah. And I know you had Valavan or Valavan, is that right? That, that, is a in, that is a Indian. That is a Indian dance club, which uh, I think I'm the first Chinese guy that actually did the Indian dance club in Malaysia. <laughs> 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 so you were having that kind of lifestyle, which is you know yeah. you like to party, you like that nightlife, the booze, and you thought it would be a good business since you enjoy it so much. You Correct. know, if you're passionate about what you enjoy, you're supposed to do good business with it, and then you realize it didn't happen that way. Correct. So what happened then? How did you then fail so many times? And what happened that then came back to this F&B? You went to lecture full-time or you were still practicing law? What was the whole entire journey like? No, no, I never really practiced law. Uh, my lectureships, yes, I did it for about eight years. Uh, eight and, and another few more years after that, which was not nothing very much. It was more like a part-time part -time basis and everything. But uh, the general time where I was lecturing for, in law was from 93 to about the year 2000. So in the year 2000 is where my party lifestyle began. And I started going up clubbing. 
and all these kind of things that I used to do. So yes, and during that, that, that time at that age, you enjoy that kind of lifestyle very, very much. I, I believe I even pulled over to, to your office one day and I was intoxicated as hell. <laughs> but I decided to pay you a visit that morning. <laughs> Which I think is cool because I was also in the entertainment business. It kind of you know, mixed from entertainment, your kind of nightlife to my kind of movie business and entertainment. So I think it's kind of yep. cool, you know. But uh, what then was the turning point? Was it that you were in so much financial pain because of the failures of the earlier businesses? Or was it that you figure out that, you know, along this journey, I've, I kind of learned the, the, the loops and the holes of this business that I can figure out how to do it better and make good money from it? Okay, when we, when we start off this, this um, when we start off in this uh, journey, right? Um, like I say, the reason why you go into it is because you like the lifestyle. Yeah, but there again, it's not something that is sustainable because uh, when I started off, it was more towards alcoholic beverages that I was trying to push. Yeah. So, because that's what I like to do. But after a few years, you will find that you are you're very very worn down by that. You won't be able to conduct your business properly, and you end up drinking your entire bar, not the customers. <laughs> when you call some friends to come over, well, some of them will ask you to buy them a drink, which is very customary to do. So all these things add up over the years and before you know it, you don't even know what has happened to yourself. Now you understand why I came over to your office half intoxicated. <laughs> I know. So, so yeah. my, my whole entire visit was the turning point in your life to get off being intoxicated <laughs> and do business correctly. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> so okay, the turning so point actually came when um, I was of the opinion that going this on a long term it's definitely not a solution to a success, to a yeah. success story, right? So definitely we needed to introduce a certain balance to this food and beverage. Knowledge-wise, along the way, yes, we begin to pick up, you know, you get to get, uh, you get your life experience through the years, which you can definitely use to your advantage in the future, which for me is actually now. But the important point for me was that uh, to escape that kind of lifestyle and to really build a business out, out of it, we really had to know, uh, to figure out the balance between what we are selling in a place. If we are going to sell all our alcohol and whiskey and beer, well, uh, I don't think so. It's going to be sustainable in the long run. If you have if you have sustained yourself for five years, you have considered done quite a good job. If you are there for eight years, you have done a phenomenal job. And if you just continue to do that, probably you need to change your name at some time also. <laughs> all right. So that's good to know that you finally were able to figure out that you're going to be balancing it to do better business and you met Don Daniel. So the whole idea came about, was it like a selection of a location? That's why you decided that it was going to become non-halal and you wanted to provide like really good cheap beer. Was that the idea behind it that kind of like made it so uh, popular? Because it was kind of a weird mix, you know, it's in a China, Chinese kind of an area, SS2. And it's very sort of like nicely renovated with really cheap beer. I think you kind of made that a household concept and a lot of people followed that after that. So how did that come about? Okay, actually how Uncle Don's was, uh, the branding of Uncle Don's came about was because in 2012, after 12 years of entertaining people in the entertainment industry, in the nightlife and having uh, countless bouts of alcohol, it, it came on to me that I had I needed to start a business which actually focuses on moving food from the kitchen. So this, this project actually came about, which is actually Dukes and Duchess. In 2012, we, uh, I started Dukes and Duchess in 2012. But of course, that time, finding a chef uh, to manage the kitchen and everything became a challenge. It's very, very difficult to find a person who can consistently be there for you all the time, every day. You know, that kind of stuff. Chances are they won't turn up to work. Uh, they will resign after two years, uh, sorry, two months. And uh, your problem is, it goes on and on and on. And it's very, very difficult to fix these kind of problems. So what did you have to do to finally then make this Uncle Don's work? Because it didn't just work. It worked very, very well in a very short period of time, which I personally feel you also never experienced that before. So what was that click or that magic, you know? Because obviously you have been around for 40 some years doing this and then all of a sudden it clicked. So what click? Sometimes we have to be lucky in life. Like. 
So that's why I was a bit lucky. I was a bit fortunate when I met Don uh, in Changkat. We didn't exchange numbers, but we met again in Tamantun uh, after about a year after that. So we clicked again down there in Dukes and Duchess. And uh, we, after this time, we, we also had one or two people on board with me, which was very good in recruitment. Uh, so we, we actually had a team. So I was thinking that we actually had a very, very good core. And now we had the chef because I tried the food and everything. I mean, it was good. So um, that for me was actually the missing link to, to the success in the business. Yeah, I mean, personally, you know, I, you know, I teach a lot of business owners. I work with a lot of different entrepreneurs. When I came to Uncle Don's, my first impression was, man, this place is kind of like relaxed. It's cool. It's nine, nicely renovated. And the food is pretty good and affordable with damn good tasting affordable beer. So I think that, that kind of draw me. And then the other funny thing was there was family sitting around with their children eating. So somehow or another, I do not know what to call it other than like a very <laughs> nice looking, uh, I would say high class mama kind of a cool, relaxing, but it, it just worked. Was that like a plan out thing or? Yes, absolutely planned out. You see, it actually goes back to the foundation of how I started the business. Alcohol doesn't really work in the long run. So in this project that we're going to do, what was the first thing that we had to, to decipher was that we have to make sure that we push out a certain amount of food and maybe to a lesser extent, beverages. Then of course, the setup and everything uh, is so vital because we wanted to target senior citizens. We want to target uh, parents. The parents want to bring the kids, you know. So we had to we had to come up with with a uh, with a uh, environment that was friendly for families. So it had to be uh, it had to be bright, you know, not too bright but not too dark. It cannot be dark, that's for sure, because uh, I mean, no kids is going to ask the parents to to you know go to this this particular ABC pub to to, to eat a chicken chop. I mean, that's not going to happen. So all these things were were debated. They were finely tuned. What, what are the environments that are needed to draw in the crowd that we want? So out of this crowd that we actually comes and patronizes our, our place, well, we do not really want the drinkers to booze and get drunk down there because that's not the idea of having Uncle Don's to have this kind of, uh, this, to portray this kind of an image. But much rather we want families, we want groups of friends. They come down there, they have a good time. Maybe about seven or eight, of course, before coronavirus came along. Sure. So each one of them have about two, three, two, three drinks, you know. So in the end, we also do move our alcoholic beverages, but at a very consistent rate and ratio compared to the food. I think that's very, very well uh, planned in the arrangement because at the end of the day, I think you're very right in saying you don't want to just move the booze, but also families who come and eat the food. So the alcohol don't come across as it's a boozing place, but it's like a Find you know like a relaxed, chillax kind of place correct. for family and yep. children to eat and drink at the same time, right? So yes, I, correct. I, yeah, I think it worked perfectly. Now I I understand that uh, the coronavirus that you just mentioned over here also um, is always packed. You know, I I think it's like Uncle Don as a two taman tune everywhere. It's like tables are outside and everywhere. How did it impact Uncle Don's during this last three months? Well, of course, uh, the coronavirus pandemic is not good for us, uh, just like it is not good for all other food and beverage industry. In fact, a lot of industries today that are so badly impacted by, by this pandemic. So we have to make a, a lot of changes because if you're going to sit there and wait, well, guess what? I think you're going to go six feet under. So we have, to, we, we have to make sure that we get our planning spot on. And of course, this is where uh, experience in the past on how, how to handle difficult situations and everything comes in. And we need to move into crisis management, which means we can't open our doors. What, what is the next thing we have to do? We have to, we, we have to be creative in how we want to move our products. So we will have to start things like delivery. We have got to start moving our staff around, you know, because our staff are basically, they are redundant. We don't need so many anymore but we don't want to let them go, so it's not good. So we try to retrain them in different departments so that they can still help us out. They can still move our revenue for us, albeit not that much, but it still contributes in the end. So we still can cushion the losses until this thing clears up. So we are saying that we are still losing money in Uncle Don's in the last three months and we're still trying to uh, 
bring it back up to regular times and revenues. Has it come back up since we have gone to RMCO? Uh, I think during this, even before the RMCO, the CMCO, we were quite all right. Uh, our tables are really maxed out. But of course, because of social distancing, you, yeah. you can only enjoy 30 or maybe 35% max of the full capacity. So revenue-wise, of course, we are still impacted. But we have to make a lot of uh, changes to bring down the overhead uh, expenses of the company, which I think is also a good thing because it gives us a chance to go back to magnify and look into the element of uh, efficiency effectiveness, how are we going to execute and how are we going to run? A lot of these things, because our revenue was so high in the past, it uh, bypasses our, our eyes. You know, a lot of things that we, we, we could have uh, looked into, but we didn't really have the time to look into because of the way the business was run and at, you know, the, the rate at which we were progressing. But this actually now gives us a way we can actually go back and magnify everything again. And so, we, can, we can actually take a lot of positives out of this because we have actually tightened a lot of loopholes. And when this thing is over, I think we'll come back even very much stronger. I think it's very interesting, you know, um, very few, even I myself am very blessed that we actually have this opportunity to go through this pandemic, that we are able to zero in on all the loopholes and to actually come back stronger because we are definitely much more effective, efficient for those who survive through this yes. pandemic, of course, yep. right? Now, how many of this... Uh, Uncle Don's, and how many outlets do you have throughout Malaysia? That's one. Secondly is, how many is your own, own, owned by you guys? And how many is actually franchise? Okay, we have, um, to date, we have 18. We have four in the pipeline that is uh, due for completion, but uh, probably be completed. Three will be completed uh, next month. And one will probably be completed only in November or December, simply because um, the developer has postponed the project to the end of the year. That's in Kota Kamuning, by the way. Sure. So, yeah, out of this, uh, out of this three projects that are going to be handed over, uh, one of them belongs to us. And the current one, the current, the current other outlets, uh, seven plus two. So we have nine, including the one which is upcoming, which is in Ipoh, will be 10. 10. So yeah. all you have 10 outlets that's within your group, and then yeah. the rest are franchisees. 12 will be franchised so far. Okay, and yeah. do you make better money selling booze and food or do you make better money selling <laughs> the franchises? <laughs> well, selling the franchise, um, it is actually a, a good way because uh, I think it's a win-win situation. One, we do not have to work that hard apart from the beginning part where we really have to train them. A lot of the franchisees who come on board, they have zero uh, experience in food and beverage, but we show them the way how to do it so that they do not fall into the potholes like what I did last time. So in effect, this is not just a business opportunity, but much rather, it is an education for them. We yeah. show them how to do it, you learn how to do it, and also at the same time, you can make some money out of it. I so think it's everything rolled into one. Yeah, I have a friend here who also, I think he takes care of leasing for mines too. Uh, Brand Ho, he said, can get Uncle Don, get Ian to open one in Mines to where my college is. I know you have one in a C180 already around the area. Yes, so what is the criteria of locality and uh, how far does it have to be away from one another? Right now, it's uh, supposed to be eight kilometers. Yeah, but for the new ones, it's uh, five. It's down to five. And um, probably we'll be working on a few nitty gritties on that as well. What are the criteria for you to select a location? Is it usually a developer who come to you and say, you know what, this uh, Uncle Don's going to help us out to bring the crowd or is it going to be like, hey, our area is just so hot, it's going to help your brand. So which is your, what are the criteria that you select? Well, actually the good bl blueprint for this kind of business would be if you can actually find a commercial unit that is actually flanked by a lot of uh, residential areas. Let's say, for example, Taipan. So Taipan is one outlet that does extremely well because of this. You know, you have a lunch crowd because it's commercialized around that area, but you yeah. also have a, a, a crazy amount of residents around that area, which can, can really, really drive your revenue. So th this is the kind of things that is, is good to look out for. But uh, as far as malls and all these kind of things is concerned, uh, sometimes their, their rental is a little bit steep, which and they also go on GTO at some times, which doesn't really work for us because... Uh, we are a high volume and uh, how should I say, moderate to lower margin. So 
sometimes when they impose GTOs or up to 10 to 15 percent, it doesn't work for us. You know, the, the, the model of the business simply doesn't work unless some of them, they really want our brand to come inside. They will just uh, scrap the GTO and they will give us a very competitive rate. Then, yes, we can go inside and we can do something for them. I think that's a very good lesson over there. You know, just the two words of one is if it's a commercial where it's a huge lunch crowd and then it's also with a lot of residential. That two criteria itself would definitely be a good location to look for. And of course, not being in shopping malls, which have all this GTO and it's just extraordinary cost without, does not make sense at all. I think these are some of the fundamentals that's good to take note of. Now, has there been any of your outlets or your franchisees that have selected a wrong location and because of what reason they have failed? But so far, every one of them is actually doing quite well. So uh, we have yet to, to come across a, a place which um, um, isn't doing uh, particularly well. Uh, I would say that the worst they are is still above average. So I think we don't have anything to complain about so far. But probably those that are just above average, we are trying our level best to see what we can do to boost them up a little bit further. So how much is it to pay you to get a franchise, <laughs> uh, Uncle Don's franchise? <laughs> Our, our branding our branding charge is 375 and that lasts for five years 375,000 what comes with it do we do we just get uh, everything from your central kitchen or do we get to negotiate on what kind of menu we want to offer oh definitely everything has to follow the standard operating uh, procedures yes everything comes from our central kitchen we roll out everything from there because uh, as per what I explained earlier we had so much of difficulties if you want to find a chef that is skilled and is going to handle your entire kitchen, well, anytime he can walk away. So we have decided, Don, Don and myself, Don, Daniel and myself, we have uh, came up with this system whereby we isolate the central kitchen and the outlet. So none of them know what the other is doing, right? We produce <laughs> the things down there, right? The, uh, the central kitchen will give you 70% of the taste. The balance need to come from the outlet. So it's like the KFC uncle, uh, Colonel Sanders kind of model, right? Where yeah, yeah, we, two right. persons having the key and two correct. persons have to come together to make it work. Actually, it's more than two, it's three because within the central kitchen itself, we are compartmentalized. I see, I see. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who have just joined us over here, you're watching the Ernie Chan Show live. I am with the founder, CEO, and the man behind this whole entire popular and also just a household name, Uncle Don's that just boom within the last few years over here from zero in SS2, one outlet and they've become like a whole entire, whole bunch of them, like a 99 speed mark of the uh, F&B industry. So you're watching Yen Ong on the Ernie Chan show right now. Do ask questions if any questions over here and we'll be able to ask Yen so they can answer you and give you some tips on the F&B. Now, I know you definitely made a lot of money when you were booming so quickly, so fast. Now with this whole entire pandemic that just happened, and you just mentioned this now, you know, we will come back stronger after this whole entire process. Now, do you foresee that you're going to be on schedule according to your plans? Because a lot of F&B are shutting down and a lot of it just kind of written off 2020. No one expected Wawasan 2020 to be like this. <laughs> yes. Have you written off 2020 or is it really going to be starting out as in it's going to be another great second half of the year as we move into second half of the year? Absolutely, I'm not wiping it out. I'm not throwing in a towel. I think it's going to be a great second half of the 2020 for us. You know, uh, when I say that we come back stronger, although our revenue, our, our capacity is down to 35%, but our revenue is not. So we are, we are, we are still above, uh, although it's reduced, but it is not reduced by that much. So we are in actually very good state right now. Have there been new plans for, even though you're going back up to serving face-to-face, -face, are the plans for delivery going to be enhanced just in case if the coronavirus in Malaysia or whatever not else comes back? Are, is Uncle Don's prepared for the future for the delivery to be even uh, sped up or even better put in place for the future? Delivery is going to be a major thing for us. In fact, we, uh, I'm looking to create it as a as another arm in our, our holdings company, which we are going to do UD deliveries. So after this, um, you'll probably be able to, to order things online using your own app, you know, and all this kind of stuff is going to come directly to your house. Well, this is something which we, we definitely studied and we have to do it because uh, this is the way the world is moving into. So pandemic or not, deliveries is definitely something you, we, we have to, we, we, are, we are working on. 
uh, probably in the next two months is going to launch. Great. So what's the future like for Uncle Don's and Yen Ong? What is the future like? What is the big plan and what are you planning to be doing with the brand? Is, that, is this going to be UD deliveries and then UD, <laughs> UD coffee house, UD bubble tea, UD whatever, you know, that comes with the UD brand? Well, of course, we, we, we still want to dabble in this business because I enjoy it so much because right now I don't have to drink and get drunk all the time. <laughs> so that's the main thing that uh, I can actually enjoy my life, although there's a lot of pressure here and there, definitely in any, in any business that you do. But uh, the ultimate aim, of course, is for us to corporatize uh, our, our, entire, our entire setting uh, in such a way that uh, I deem fit for for the future of Uncle Don's. Is that corporatized as in, are you going for an IPO? Is that going to be fundraising to then be buying up new brands? And also, I mean, that's going to be literally, literally is going to be a mega sale in Q4. I'm sure you know, once the moratorium is over, <laughs> there's going to be so many F&B businesses up for sale. And I'm sure you've been planning for that and you're targeting for a fundraising to acquire all this, to put under this corporatized entity. Yes, definitely. We are we are looking to pick up um, certain uh, components of F and B, so that we are not just Uncle Don's as in what you know today. We want to have our own, uh, maybe our different cake house. You know, our everything that actually comes under UD Express, where people can actually just walk inside and just take away. So the entire thing as a whole. That's what we are we are planning to give you the the full impact of what the UD brand is all about. Do you feel the future of dining is still going to be very much what it used to be? Or do you feel that because of the pent-up demand, you know, we've all been stuck at home for the past three months. And all of a sudden, I went to Uncle Don's Quarter Damansara because I was like, man, I just got to go for Uncle Don's, you know. But do you feel it's because of the three months being in a prison at home and we are all just rushing out to eat and ha have that kind of experience and it's going to die off because... We are going to feel that, hey, I'm actually more comfortable at home. Do you feel that you're going to be closing down more outlets and having more UD approach from the central kitchen itself? Well, I don't think so. There's a possibility of that. I mean, uh, the probability of that is uh, virtually nil, simply because uh, we must know what we are doing, right? Um, we create a very safe environment for our patrons. We make sure that uh, our all our staff, you know, they are very well taken, protective-wise, uh, they are they are. They're very well taken care of. So a lot of our patrons that come in, they also feel, uh, they feel quite safe to come inside. And of course, we are, uh, we are more like a restaurant rather than a bar. That's why I, one of the reasons why bars are closed today is because when people have too many, one too many, they start to get closer and closer and closer. So there's a reason for that. So that, uh, doesn't, necess that doesn't really happen in our place because um, we have our diners. So do you feel that it's because of your age, you know, because you were younger, you were partying, and of course that lifestyle kind of changed, the business kind of evolved with you, you know, it's like Miley Cyrus, the good <laughs> American girl that was followed by all these young American young girls. As she grew, she needed to have this new kind of uh, image and branding that was a bit more wild so that her growing following would also grow with her. Is it that the same thing with Yen Ong that a lot of the people used to party with you and drink with you are today becoming more like parents and they will now continue to come and dine at your restaurant and not just, they can still enjoy drinking, but with their families. Is that what you think has happened? Well, probably I've seen more than half of them coming to dine with their families here. Well, we used to, we used to go out and party and, uh, you know, and paint the street red during the, during the days. So yes, I think to a, to a certain extent that is also true. And uh, the way the way we handle our own lives today is, um, I think this is more reflective of our age today, rather than yeah. what we were fifteen years ago. So that means that even though we are getting older, there's going to be another group of young individuals who like the party lifestyle, who will probably do better in that kind of club and the bar scene as well, right? Yep. That's the way business works, right? We evolve and we become something else that we never expected ourselves to become and evolve in our lifestyle. And that's usually what happens. So what's next for Yen Ong? Because I know you also are like my dad before where you have uh, diabetes, right? Personally. And uh, is that type two and you have to manage your food intake and this drinking and stuff? Is that something that you have to deal with? 
No, I'm no longer diabetic. <laughs> oh, no longer. Actually, I was I was pre-diabetic, but I'm no longer diabetic. I wow. don't. I I overcome it without using drugs, but uh, on a proper diet, uh, exercise, and I'm done. That's amazing, right? That's how yeah. how I, I myself lost a lot of weight, and of course, I uh, also very concerned about that uh, diabetic uh, process of unnecessary things. You know, my dad also, I'm sure you know, uh, passed away because of diabetes as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that everyone have to look after after as we get older and we age a little bit more. So, what's the future for Yen Ong? The future for Ian Ong is to, to continue my, my journey to learn from life experiences and probably to share it with the people that are coming up. Because I think, um, I think sharing is, uh, is, is very, very important for this. Uh, a lot of people will not actually um, tell you their trade secrets, of course, because uh, they, view, they deem it to be essential for their own success. But you're not telling them everything, but much rather guiding them along the way, which, for example, one of the things we do for our franchises, we guide them along the way, although, of course, they pay us. Um, but it's a very enjoyable thing doing that, passing on the knowledge to the next people and to see them being able to carry and bring up the brand. Well, that, that gives me a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, I don't know why somehow that happens as we get older, you know? It's <laughs> like we screw up a lot and then we want to pass on the lessons of how they will not screw up. But somehow or another, they just don't seem to listen until they screw up themselves, right? So, What's up? Well, there's nothing, there's nothing better than learning it first-hand experience, isn't it, right? When you, yeah. when, when you are given advice and um, you, you're given good advice and you take it, you may, you may reach your goals, but you didn't go through it the hard way. So it's, it's although you reach there, but the path taken is different. You know, now, it's, uh, you one is to... very much a student, the other one is a warrior. So there you it's, go. It's, yeah, it's That's different set of person that reaches the, the, the goal. If the warrior of Yen Ong today were to tell yourself 20 years back, 20 years ago, you know, what would the warrior tell that student if you were starting out 20 years ago? I probably couldn't have told him anything because uh, I'm very glad what has actually happened. Um, like I say, this, um, the mind is everything. Our greatest gift is not our body, it's actually our mind. Sure. So the mind can actually do wonders. The mind can take so much of an abuse, right? It, 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 is, it is very, very, very durable. So when we start off, uh, even let's say, for example, in school, when we graduate and everything, our education has actually just begun, right? And if I can actually go back in time and tell the younger Ian on what to do, I don't think so. Uh, he will be the same Ian Ong as I am today. <laughs> now... You studied law. We all know that. You came from La Salle, you know, uh, a brother school. And then you went and partied and you went into this whole entire different business. There are a lot of young people out there who are studying things. Perhaps they don't know why they're studying that. And also the new way of doing business. You potentially may not need to have studied law, but somehow perhaps you have studied it to figure out how to break the law, I suppose. And... <laughs> Why, what would you tell all these young entrepreneurs out there? I'm sure you have gone through a lot of hell and also a lot of challenges and obstacles, but a lot of people always don't seem to understand unless they've actually gone through it themselves. What would you say to all these young individuals wanting to become an entrepreneur or entrepreneurs out there who are in the F&B or whatever businesses having a lot of challenges and obstacles during this pandemic? Well, if you are facing uh, obstacles, which you definitely will, no business is going to be smooth sailing all the way. Then you just have to you will just have to 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 learn from the mistakes that has that uh, you know you have uh, you have committed. If we do not change or we do not uh, take any lessons from the mistakes that we have made, then that mistake becomes very very expensive. So we have to learn from our mistakes then. And yep. what would be your greatest mistake that you learned from and never repeat? Was it all this intoxication and you decided you know what I cannot continue this way? Well, one is, um, uh, one is actually, the main thing actually is that uh, sometimes my main regret sometimes is uh, to go into business with friends. Some of them are, I mean, they're, they're, they're still good friends with me today, but sometimes friends are friends. They are meant to be friends and not for you to go into business with. Sometimes when you're starting out in business, you always feel safer when a friend tags along with you. Although sometimes you don't even know what is he doing there. 
<laughs> Friends are meant to talk, talk and sing shit, man. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to do business together, you know. It's not just not supposed. That's why I don't do business with Yen Ong. We have friends, you know. That's what we do, you know. Hey, Brand Ho here. I'm from La Salle too. Yes, you have a La Salian over here too, you know. I'm a BB and we don't get along with La Salians, but you know what? Hey, when it comes to the business world, we got to get along and do better business together. You now, get along very well with uh with uh what do you call that? Um, uh, there, there is a school. It's always uh, La Salle and Asunta, and BB Aman is always with Sri Aman. Sri Aman, yes. Sri Aman. It's always a boys <laughs> school and a girls school, right? And that's the whole idea, you know. That's the beauty of it all. Now, do you spend a lot of time at home nowadays with your family, or is it really taking up even more of your time? Because a lot of people is finding it difficult to balance a successful growing business and also the family. Uh, I work a lot at home. In fact, uh, well, we have the power of the internet today. We have our servers, so everything I can access from the house. Um, but I do travel quite a lot right now because we are trying to we are trying to make this brand uh, nationwide by next year. Sure. So I think we are we are on par. We are on course to to complete that, and we are looking at the international um, market thereafter. Any any immediate country plans or? People that you're looking for to invest, or have there, have there been a country, a big F and B play in another country coming to show interest in the brand? Yes, they have. Uh, we are we are actually trademark registered in Singapore, China, and Thailand so far. Australia and a few other countries are pending. Um, we are just waiting for the right time because uh, of the pandemic right now. Everything has has stalled. So, but I'm actually quite interested in uh, setting foot in Singapore for a start. That's good, man. That's good. That's good to yeah. know. And very course, similar, very similar taste between uh, Malaysians and Singapore. So I think that's a good place to start, and not too far away from home. Yes, I think, and it will definitely grow and uh, move very, very quickly, very fast. I would think that it's going to become like uh, Uncle Don's premium, you know, in Singapore because <laughs> people just like to pay more to experience whatever they experience in Singapore. So that's the whole idea over there. Great. Now, if there's one last thing that you like to advise this people out there, what would that be? Be it business owners, young individuals who is now wanting to do better for themselves. What would you tell them? Should you fall flat on your face? Don't worry about it. Pick yourself up, dust yourself down, carry on your journey. This is a marathon. It is not a sprint. So you, you have to be patient. You will have to get your, your, your organization right. You will have to get your back end right. There are so many things that you will have to put it together to complete the puzzle. Even our puzzle is not complete. It's far from complete. So uh, how big you want the picture to be is how far your mind can think. So that's why the mind is always the most powerful tool. I think the puzzle will be complete with the Ernie Chan in the puzzle as well. That will probably work, uh, <laughs> just nice over there. You need, you need a media guy. You need a person in front of the camera. You need a person to be out there shouting the brand to the whole entire world. And that's the theme. We use this social media, right? Uncle Don and Ernie Chan being the man behind the media scene. I think that's something we gotta look into. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you very much for coming on to the Ernie Chan show. Thanks for the time. Good to see you again. And next time, definitely we'll be meeting up in the Uncle Don, wherever you may be. Let me know. We'll chill and drink some beers, man. Good definitely, to see you, again. man. Sure, Good sure. Thanks, thanks for having me on your show. Thank you very much. Hey, take care. Right. And everybody, you've been watching the Ernie Chan Show live. We've been speaking to Yen Ong, the founder and CEO, the man behind the Uncle Don's brand as you see them grow all over Malaysia and they'll be taking the world by storm. Thank you very much and have a good night, everybody. Good night, Ian. Thank you very good night, much. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.